So, look at what's on the ground. Did I tell you it was going to be fall last week? I did, didn't I? So don't act surprised. Look at all this shit on the ground. Look at all the colors. It's pretty great, actually. So, episode 26, one half of a year. Yes, we're still in it. Uh, no indication of when we're going to get out of it. So let's just hang in there and do the best we can. Uh, on that topic, um, it is, uh, it's National No More Excuses Day which I, I kind of love, actually. It's no more excuses. Well, fuck off, you know? Start having fun. Do stuff. Quit your moping. I know there, there's probably a strong temptation to mope now uh, and, and, and whinge, as they say, and the Brits say. You quit your whinging and moaning. So really, you know, just buck up. It, it's going to be this way for a while, okay? It just is. So let's make the best of it, okay? Let, let's do what we can. Um, I don't know, let's learn about folk music or, or something, anything, you know, whatever. Um, it is also Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur I, I got to say that right. So uh, it's Yom, Yom Kippur, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. So if you're fasting, uh, good work, keep, keep up the good work. It is Randy Bachman's birthday. Da -na 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 -na. Taking care of business. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take care of a little bit of business and we are going to, we're going to think about Pete Seeger, okay? So you guys just hang on and uh, we will talk to you in a moment. All right. Bye. Hey, people. So um, I'm thinking about Pete Seeger, you know, and here, here's the dealio, is that uh, when you're all grown up, like I am, you can, uh, you can sometimes look back, you know, and with all your experience and all those years and all that shit you've done, and you can go, you can reassess stuff, you know, as long as your brain is not totally fucking calcified. Um, you can look back at that band you loved in the early 80s that you thought just was the cat's ass and were, like, amazing. And you can look back now and go, what on earth was I fucking thinking? They are awful. This can happen. See, if your brain is not completely calcified, you can look back at that stuff and be a little embarrassed because that at that time that band appealed to your little dough-like brain you know your your unformed neurons were like uh, were tricked into thinking that they were good when in fact they they sucked so the opposite can happen okay and this is this is where i'm going with pete seeger is that bands that uh, i used to think uh, or or music that it didn't hit me didn't care for it actually kind of bugged me a little bit um it was kind of the opposite of what i wanted um, maybe it's time for a little reassessment of this. So, uh, Pete, let's, Pete, Pete is like the, the, the solid rock foundation of a lot of the American folk scene, okay? He, he was there from the beginning, very early on, you know, yeah, he was, he was born in 1919. His dad, Charles, was, uh, was, and his mom were all into music. You know, they were music collectors. They were music players. In fact, his dad ended up being, uh, being signed on to the University of Berkeley in California as a, wait for it, <laughs> ethnomusicologist. Yes. Why do we mock the ethnomusicologists? I don't know. I just think they're funny. But God bless them. You know, they've done a good job and, 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 Thank you, ethnomusicologists. Um, anyway, so uh, Pete, uh, you know, he's, he's got this musical family. Uh, his dad uh, divorces and remarries and has two, two other kids. Who are they? Mike, Mike Seeger, who I, we already talked about. He's, he's the guy, big influential folk guy, the holy modal rounders. And, you know, he, he's, in, he's up, to his, up to his arson folk. And he's the guy who's put on that only uh, guitar workshop that I've ever freaking been to. And I learned the Vestipal song. Peggy Seeger is his sister and is Pete's uh, half-sister. And, uh, of course, she's, uh, you know, the little Peggy who was lost in the department store. And Elizabeth Cotton finds her, and the rest is history. Elizabeth Cotton comes home with them, lives with them, raises Mike and Peggy, teaches them everything they know about folk. And, 
and later on, Peggy hooks up with Ewan McCall for uh, kind of a, you know, they're they're a, a super uh, super couple in the folk world, right? Whatever. They're the Kardashians of the folk. God, I can't believe I said that. So anyway, there they are, um, the Seegers. Um, so as a teenager, young Pete, he's a, his dad takes him off to this hootenanny in North Carolina, is put on by Bascom Lamar Lunsford. <laughs> Remember Bascom? He's the guy who uh, who recorded Mole in the Ground on the, the famous uh, folk anthology. And uh, that's the song that uh, eventually uh, Jackson C. Frank turned into Kimby. So Bascom, he's a happening dude. He's playing banjo. He's doing that clogging. He's a little ball of energy setting up folk, cons- uh, folk shows and stuff down there in North Carolina. And he's just such a happy guy. And... Uh, Pete sees him playing the five-string banjo, and Pete cannot believe his frickin' eyes, and he basically, his, his, his world has changed. There, there's an earthquake in, in his little dough-like brain, and he, he gets Bascom Lamar to actually show him a little, a couple of banjo licks, and the rest is frickin' history. So Pete is off like a shot, and uh, he actually becomes a pretty good banjo player. He even writes a book. Pete writes a book in 1940, How to Play the Five-String Banjo. So if you want to learn how to play the five-string banjo, you look up Pete's book because uh, it has been the uh, it's been the introduction to banjo for a lot of people, and it's still still out there. It's still still a good book if that's what you want to do. So um, anyway, so Pete uh, later on, Pete actually Pete and his dad Charles end up working at the Library of Congress for another <laughs> ethnomusicologist, Alan Lomax. So. Pete's job is to, uh, you know, to kind of index and listen to all these millions of field recordings um, and, and to help Alan uh, kind of sort them out. So early, early on, Pete is already like amassing this, this incredible uh, knowledge of American folk music that, that is simply not available to most people. So he, he, he's just soaking in it, right? And he's, uh, he's learning all this stuff from Al, Alan and, and his dad. So it, it's pretty much inevitable that Pete's going to form a band. What kind of band is Pete going to form? Well, it's the late 30s, early 40s, and at that time, at, at all times basically, folk music is, is strongly associated with left-wing causes, okay? It just is. So what's going on at that time? There's, this, uh, there's the biggest surge of unionization in American history is going on by this, uh, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, not the CIA. The CIA is a different thing. They're not organizing anything good. Uh, the CIO are uh, a union. They're, they're, a, they're an umbrella union uh, organization, and they are unionizing all the industrial shops up in Detroit and all across the U.S., and they're pretty radical. They're strongly anti-racist. They are strongly for better working conditions, they are in favor of better pay. They are in favor of a shorter work week. All these things we kind of uh, sort of take for granted uh, now nowadays. They they were there, um, doing doing the legwork, you know, educating people, and uh, and part of that whole thing was folk singers were were on this bandwagon, and they were totally for this unionization push. And, uh, you know, this very left-wing unionization push. So, Young Pete, okay? So, Young Pete, I don't know, what is it? 3940, forms this band. Um, Who's in the band? Woody. Woody Guthrie's in the fucking band, okay? So, Pete already is big buddies with Woody. Pete's also big buddies with a bunch of other people, like, uh, you know, Sonny Terry, Brian McGee, Lead Belly, Josh White. He, he know he's, by, even in his 20s, he knows everybody. So, him and Woody, um, and these other guys, Millar, Lumpel, and Lee Hayes, they formed this band called the Almanac Singers, which kind of exists from 40 to 43. And they are doing, uh, they're doing songs for, you know, uh, the Spanish Civil War veterans. They are doing union songs, uh, a lot of union songs, and a lot of songs like, you know, Stick It to the Boss. You know, um, Woody has, the, one of the songs they do in the Almanac Singers is, is Woody's song, Union Made. It's kind of a double entendre, right? So Made is spelled M-A-I-D. <laughs> Oh, clever. Not M-A-D-E. So it's not Union Made, it's Union Made. So Union Made is like uh, one, one, one righteous babe who is uh, a Union Babe. So it's like there, there, there once was a Union Maid. She never was afraid 
of goons and ginks and company finks and the deputy sheriff who made the raid. She went to the union hall when the meeting was called and when the legion boys came round she always stood her ground. Oh, you can't scare me, I'm sticking with the union. I'm sticking with the union. I'm sticking with the union. Oh, you can't scare me, I'm sticking with the union. I'm sticking with the union until the day I die. Sticking with the union. So that's the kind of songs they're playing. So, um,. By this point, uh, young Pete is a card-carrying member of the Communist Party of the of the United States, and at that time, uh, the Popular Front, which was kind of uh, you know uh, kind of this organization of left-leaning people and communists and, and liberals, uh, their 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 focus was to keep the the U.S. out of the war. They figured it was just a big uh, it was a big hoax. Um, there's there's a word that means something different now. Um, it used to mean something that was not true, but now I think it means something that is true. I'll have to look that up. Okay. Um, anyway, they were they didn't want the 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 U.S. to join the war, and that was that was from the Communist Party. And then in '41, uh, the Germany invades Russia, and kaboom! 180 degree change. Now the party line is: we want everybody to grab a gun and uh, and go and kick Hitler's butt. So uh, that was a little embarrassing for those for those dudes, I guess. But uh, that that's how that worked. Anyway, the Almanac Singers, uh, you know, then they they start all playing all these you know patriotic songs, you know, like "Give Me a Gun" and uh, "I'll Kick Hitler's Butt" and stuff like that. But the FBI was not fooled. They knew they were pinkos, and uh, basically they hounded them pretty much out of existence. So uh, you know, then uh, Pete he joins the army. He's supposed to be a, an airplane mechanic or something, but. Uh, according to his own account, basically he spent the war just playing banjo to the troops, which, you know, could be worse. You know, you know got your bullets whizzing over your head and having, having a little banjo picking uh, might be a good way to calm the nerves. Maybe. So after the war, uh, Pete and some of the guys from the Almanac Singers form another band. In 48, they call it the Weavers. And uh, it's Ronnie Gilbert, Lee Hayes, who was in the Almanac Singers, Fred Hellerman. And... Uh, they write a bunch of new songs, and they are enormously successful. Like, they just have number one hits. They're selling millions of records with this folk music. You know, I think they start off with Good Night Irene, which was, you know, the song they learned from Lead Belly. And, uh, you know, what else they got? They're playing all these great folk songs, you know, like... Uh, if I had a hammer, I'd a hammer in the morning I'd a hammer in the evening All over this land I'd a hammer out danger I'd a hammer out a warning I'd a hammer out the love Between brothers and my sisters Oh, all over this land If I had a hammer Great song, great fucking song I mean, the, the way they deliver it was the way music was delivered and, you know, very kind of clean cut, you know, a bunch of guys singing harmonies, but heavy song. It, it kind of actually speaks to things today to some extent, you know, just, you know, hammer out a warning, <laughs> hammer out a danger. There's fucking danger going on here, I'll tell you that. Um, anyway, so the FBI is still on it, still on his ass. And they, they eventually drag him into the House of Un-American Activities, and McCarthy's a witch hunt. There's another word that doesn't mean the same thing anymore now that the witches are in charge. Um, I may have to look that one up. Uh, anyway, so there he is. And, you know, other people were dragged up too, and they named names. Pete did not name names. Some people took the fifth, and they said, you know, uh, I won't speak because I may self-incriminate myself. Pete did not do that. Pete took the first. He said the First Amendment. He says, I'm, I'm, I have freedom of speech and freedom of thought. I can think and say what I want. You have no right to ask me any questions. Well, that went over like fucking lead balloon, didn't it? And uh, so they, they charge him with contempt of Congress. Because so Pete, he's so fucking earnest. You know, he could have taken the fifth and just walked away. But no, he, uh, he's, he's got his principles. And uh, anyway, four years later, they finally have the, they have the, finally have the uh, 
you know, the court session and they charge him with 10 consecutive offenses, one year each, 10 years in jail for contempt of Congress. So the good news is he, uh, he got thrown out on appeal. So he never spent a day in jail. That's a pretty fucking heavy thing to have over your head. So this is all weighing pretty heavily on the Weavers who, you know, for a while there were going great guns. So they had to like, you know, take a little break, but then they got back together again and they, they, they kept going into the early 60s. Big shows, Carnegie Hall, you know, people loving them. Here's the thing that they're getting, they're getting hooked up with the, uh, with the civil rights movement as well, as are all folk uh, musicians. And, uh, you know, the, the folk musicians are really uh, putting themselves on the front lines, putting themselves in danger of getting beat up and, and getting killed. Uh, by going down to Selma, Alabama, and Georgia, and Tennessee, and all these other miserable places um, to to support the civil rights movement and to, you know uh, rally the troops and raise spirits, which is their job, and to educate. So that that's what they thought their job was anyway. So anyway, so they're going down there doing all that. Um, still really popular, like they're getting songs on radio, and uh, you know good songs. You know, kisses sweeter than wine. Fuck, great song. Um, it's just millions of them. Like it's just, they're permeating American culture sort of. Um, so anyway, here, one funny thing is, uh, Pete's, Pete's, when he's not playing banjo, he plays a 12 string guitar and he, uh, it's, it's, it's a big, big 12 string guitar. It's got a longer neck than normal. It's heavy. It's got this weird little triangular sound hole and he tunes it down one, two whole steps. And then he does a drop D kind of thing. So he's basically doing it in drop C. So if you don't know anything about guitar, this means nothing to you. But I'll tell you, who else does this kind of super low tuning? I will tell you, heavy metal guys. Heavy metal guys now in the 2000s and the 2020s. That's how they get that brrr, devilish sound. Pete Seeger, inventor of heavy metal music. Thank you very much. Good work, Pete. He writes on his he writes on his guitar too. You know how Woody would write this machine kills fascists. Well, uh, Pete's Pete's guitar uh, says uh, this machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. Pete could use a copywriter. He could use an editor for his for his guitar writing. It's a, it's a little lengthy. Anyway, so Pete he's just uh, he's always on the right side of uh, of every cause. It seems like he's he's anti racist. He's in the civil rights, supporting them like crazy, on the front lines, putting himself actually in danger along with lots of other people. Um, uh, he's in native rights. He was uh, worked on the Leonard Peltier uh, uh, case and, and others. Environmental. He's set up a environmental protection thing for the Hudson River. Uh, it goes on and on. He's always on the right side of karma. How the fuck does he do it? So... I'm, I'm reassessing. I'm reassessing Pete, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay, Pete's a pretty fucking cool guy. Pete is the guy basically that helped Bob Dylan get a break. You know, he was a big booster of Bob when Bob was a little schmo. And, uh, you know, despite the electric Bob thing, um, Pete was a big fan. So, you know, anyway... One of the songs that one of the songs that the Weavers did was uh, on top of Old Smokey. I will tell you a very short story. Uh, when I was when I was a wee uh, a wee a wee child in upstate New York, my uncle, my 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 mom's brother, he's a cool dude. Um, you know, a bit of a uh, appropriate for for uh, you know country guy in 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 rural area. He was a bit of a greaser. He had you know, he had the cool slick back hair. He had a tattoo. Uh, he had, he was the kind of guy, he had a jalopy, a hopped up jalopy. Of course he did. And, uh, he, he, he was the kind of guy that kind of would roll up a pack of smokes in, in his white t-shirt and walk around smoking and looking just about as fucking cool as a man could look. Uh, he had a little radio show up there and, uh, he got me on six year old Steve. This is my radio debut. And, uh, I did my, I did my rendition of on top of spaghetti. <laughs> Remember On Top of Spaghetti? Sang, sung to the, the tune of On Top of Old Smokey, like On Top of Spaghetti, all covered in cheese, I lost my poor meatball when somebody sneezed. Rolled off the table and down the floor, and then my poor meatball, it rolled out the door. That was my radio debut. All right? So, they, 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 they. kids, you know, uh, Pete, Seeger, uh, Pete Seeger loved playing to kids. Uh, he, was, he was basically a frustrated teacher, I think. Uh, even up here in Canada, there was there was a there was a kids camp called uh, uh, Camp Navelt just outside Brampton, 
which was basically a training ground for for young socialists, I guess. But uh, lots of kids went there. Who went there? Bonnie Dobson went there and saw Pete. And Bonnie, who wrote uh, Walk Me Out in the Morning Dew. Uh, Zalianovsky, who went on to form The Love and Spoonful. Lots of kids. Lots of kids saw Pete play banjo at these summer camps. Neil Young saw Pete play at a, at a camp uh, when he was a kid out in Winnipeg. So, you know, Pete, uh, he's a teacher. He's a writer. Blacklisted for years. In 67, the Smothers Brothers invited him on. They were kind of, uh, they were a little subversive themselves. And he wanted to play a, a anti-Vietnam anti War song, Waist Deep in the Big Muddy. And the uh, big uh, TV exec said, no friggin' way. You're not playing that, you pinko. So the uh, Smothers Brothers took this all the way to the top and they won. They won. And Pete got to play his song on, on national television on the Smothers Brothers in 67, Waist Deep in the Big Muddy. There you go. So Pete. He's a, a bit of a rabble rouser. He, uh, you know, he played at uh, he played the closing uh, uh, set in uh, Obama's uh, inauguration. Uh, they sang uh, "This Land Is Your Land" with Bruce Springsteen, Pete and Bruce. I mean, there's a couple of righteous dudes, eh? And uh, Obama loved him. He called him America's tuning fork. So he was like, basically, you know, he, he was just always on the right side. And uh, I'm gonna say hats off to Pete. Um, I've, 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 I've reconsidered. Um, I love your songs, okay? So, you know, let's go out with this. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Who pick them, everyone? When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? See you guys next week.